Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. We're going to continue with our discussion on the skeletal system and more specifically we're going to focus in this video on bone growth in children. In the previous couple of videos we focused on how bones develop in the fetus which tends to start around the sixth or eighth week after fertilization, more around the eighth week. And we referred to the bone formation as either intramembranous ossification or endochondral ossification. In the case of endochondral ossification, we started with a piece of cartilage, which slowly began to fall apart to be replaced with bone tissue. Well, we're going to see something very similar happening in the lengthening of bones of children. But let's not forget that children's bones just don't lengthen, they also widen. It would not make sense for a bone to just lengthen because it would get too long and spindly. So as bones lengthen in children, they also need to widen and thicken. So we're going to be looking at two types of bone growth in children. Let's first focus on how bones lengthen in children. We call this process longitudinal bone growth or interstitial bone growth. And notice that I have abbreviated bone growth by BG. I've mentioned the term interstitial growth before when we studied uh, particularly um, the endochondral ossification process, where I explained that initially the cartilaginous structure is just going to grow bigger, longer, and wider before the ossification process kicks in. And that is because cartilage cells begin to divide. They go through mitotic divisions. We refer to that as interstitial bone growth or interstitial growth in the case of uh, what is happening prior to endochondral ossification. We're going to see something very similar happening in the epiphyseal plate of a long bone. So let's take a look. So notice that I've drawn for you a typical long bone with its two epiphyses that you see here and here's its diaphysis. But this is still a bone of a growing child and you can see the epiphyseal plates that I have indicated here as these blue bands. And remember, these are made up of hyaline cartilage. Just like we have some hyaline cartilage still on the surface of the epiphyses, and we refer to that as articular cartilage. What we need to do now is focus on just one of these epiphyseal plates because that is where growth occurs. That's where the lengthening occurs. That's where the cartilage cells are going to divide. And as they make more of themselves, that is literally going to lengthen our bone. And that's the interstitial bone growth process. So allow me to just isolate that epiphyseal plate and we'll just kind of exaggerate it and make it much bigger, kind of like so. And then let's not forget that nearby it right here is going to be the beginning of the medullary cavity. So I'll just put MC here just to remind you of where we are. Whatever we're going to describe next occurs exactly the same in the uh, other epiphyseal plate, obviously. So we're going to focus on this one. So near the top of the screen, therefore, would be that is over here would be, in this area, would be the epiphysis. So keep that in mind, keep things oriented in your head. Now we can more or less see different regions, often called zones, in uh, the epiphyseal plates that are going through interstitial growth. And that is because the cartilage cells go through these different processes, just like you saw happening in endochondral ossification. So for instance, that region of the 
of the um, epiphyseal plate that sits the closest to the epiphysis consists of cartilage cells that are at rest. I'm just going to try to draw cartilage cells in their lacuni like so. They're, there's their, the cell, the cartilage cell with the nucleus, and then they sit in a lacuna. Of course, they would be much smaller. I'm kind of limited in how accurate I can be on my iPad screen, so bear with me. So those are your cartilage cells at rest. Your chondrocytes at rest. And what do they do? Well, they do what cartilage cells in highland cartilage tissue that is fully mature do. They maintain the matrix and there might be even some chondroblasts there that um, <clears throat> are secreting matrix. But if we go a little bit further away from this, if we move a little bit further away from the epiphysis, so we're starting to move into the direction of the medullary cavity, we're going to see that the cartilage cells are going through mitotic divisions and uh, without showing the lacuni and the nucleus anymore, um, the cells are literally going to look like they're stacked coins in this area. So they're dividing, they're making more of themselves, and clearly we're adding cells now to this area. Again, they kind of look like stacked coins. And because they add more cells in this area, we are literally lengthening the bone in this direction. So this, in this particular area where mitotic divisions are occurring, this is where the growth is occurring. Okay, so keep that in mind. We're adding cells and therefore we're lengthening. Uh, the whole bone. We're at this point in time essentially also lengthening the epiphyseal plate, but not for long, and you'll see what happens. Now in this next zone, again, this is just approximate how I'm drawing this, what's happening is that all of these cartilage cells, guess what, start to hypertrophy. So they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and we all know by now from having studied endochondral ossification in particular that when cartilage cells hypertrophy, unfortunately, they can't persist for very long. When they grow li larger like this, they are not going to be able to maintain their surroundings, that is the cartilage matrix, and consequently they die. So I'll put death of the cells here. And if they die, they can also not maintain the cartilage matrix around them. And so slowly but surely, the cartilage matrix begins to deteriorate. So now we're going to see an area where we just are left with remnants of cartilage. So I'm going to just draw these as such. These are just little remnants, sometimes called spicules of cartilage, that are also in the process of deteriorating. Again, all of this should remind you of endochondral ossification. So I'll call these cartilage remnants, sometimes called cartilage spicules, if you want to call them little cartilage leftovers that are in the process of deteriorating, that's fine with me. I just really understand what's happening here. Well, now what we see happening is that blood vessels that carry osteoblasts and osteoclasts and even osteogenic cells from the area, from the bone tissue nearby the epiphyseal plate um, begin to arrive. And so I will just, whoops, I shouldn't have done that from within. Let me erase that for a second, sorry you guys. Um, so now we see that blood vessels begin to move in. I'll just kind of do it like this. Actually, I could touch the medullary cavity because that's where the endosteum is, right? The endosteum lines your medullary cavity here. Might as well label that as endosteum here. So 
um, you remember that there are and uh, um, osteoblasts and osteoclasts as well. At any rate, so we're seeing these blood vessels move in that bring in osteoblasts and osteoclasts, even other cells, other blood cells, obviously, but especially these two cells. And you know what can happen now. These osteoblasts and osteoclasts can start crowding around these spicules of cartilage and what do these osteoblasts do? Well they secrete osteoid and as they secrete osteoid eventually it becomes mineralized and as it becomes mineralized it eventually is going to lead to the formation of spongy bone tissue. So we're going to see the process of ossification occurring in this area. So right here we're going to slowly but surely begin to form trabeculae. Now depending on what kind of bone tissue we really need, we might, need, we might leave some of that um, spongy bone tissue there or some of the trabeculae might fuse perhaps towards the edges here um, in that area, we might need a little bit of compact bone tissue. So try to be a little bit logical about this. At the same time, we also need to make sure that the bone doesn't get too heavy. And therefore, it is important that this medullary cavity is going to be lengthened as well. And so who does this? Who is going to be um, primarily taking care of this, clearly your osteoclasts are going to munch away at that medullary cavity to lengthen it. Your osteoclasts are playing a role in this area over here as well where we're going, going through the process of ossification to shape the trabeculae and just to shape that whole bone area in, in particular. Okay, now Earlier I said in this area where mitotic divisions, in this zone where mitotic divisions occur, that's where our bone is lengthening. And initially what that means that the epiphyseal plate is widening, obviously. We're making it literally, and I'm going to the other figure on the left-hand side now, we're literally lengthening it. And that can't keep, um, that can't stay that way. We need to make sure that that epiphyseal plate doesn't get too wide. And that's what happens here. As you see, we're replacing the cartilage tissue here with bone tissue. So we add cartilage uh, tissue here, but we take it away over here. And this is how longitudinal bone growth occurs, also called interstitial bone growth in children. So let's take a look at the figure that your book provides or any book that you use uh, on longitudinal bone growth, as I said, also called interstitial bone growth. So here's your epiphyseal uh, plate area. And once again, we're looking in the same area in a long bone. So you can imagine that the epiphysis is over here at this end. As a matter of fact, let me just um, put EP here for epiphysis. And then the medullary cavity would be more in the direction down here. I'll put MC with an arrow in that direction. So you uh, keep your orientation. Now, most books give these different regions that I just described names. And those names might vary just a little bit, but I kind of like the, the names that your book gives. So we have an area where your cartilage cells are uh, not actively busy dividing. They're just sitting there um, taking care of uh, the matrix around, surrounding them or even producing matrix. In the proliferative zone where the cells are proliferating or going through mitotic divisions, this really should say mitotic divisions rather than mitosis. Mitosis means nuclear division. Uh, while we're really dividing not just the nucleus of the cells, but also the cytoplasm by means of cytokinesis. So this is the zone where our cells are dividing. We can call it the proliferative zone. And then our cartilage cells start to hypertrophy and ultimately they begin to die. And that's going to leave us 
oh, here we see our um, zone of cell death. And this is going to ultimately leave us with matrix that gets calcified. The cartilage matrix gets calcified um, such that um, the cells die. I might have not specified that, but you might remember that from endochondral ossification, that when the uh, cartilage cells grow big, they hypertrophy, that uh, they can't maintain the matrix around them and it becomes hardened. And when it becomes hardened or calcified, the cartilage cells cannot uh, receive nutrients by means of diffusion very easily and that triggers their cell death by means of apoptosis. Of course, when they die, they cannot maintain their matrix anymore and the matrix starts to deteriorate so that we now have spaces into which blood vessels can uh, penetrate and these blood vessels are coming from the already existing bone tissue nearby and they carry with them um, osteoblasts and osteoclasts and we start to see that osteoblasts start to uh, deposit osteoid on the little pieces of cartilage that are left. I refer to them here as cartilage remnants. You can call them cartilage spicules and slowly but surely we start to see the formation of trabeculae and therefore spongy bone tissue and some of that might become compact bone tissue. Don't forget too, I didn't specify that earlier, but I'm assuming that you remember this. Anytime the osteoblasts get trapped in that osteoid that has become mineralized, they become osteocytes. So don't forget that. It's part of the whole ossification process. So this is longitudinal bone growth. And of course, this does not go on forever. And we will get to that in, in one of the next videos. Uh, but there's also the importance of widening the bone. We can't just lengthen the bone. We must also widen it. And that process is called appositional bone growth. And in a sense, you have also already learned about that when we studied both intramembranous as well as endochondral ossification. So as this figure shows, eventually that epiphyseal plate will be completely replaced with bone tissue and then we end up with an epiphyseal line. Once there's an epiphyseal line, we have actually reached the point of um, the end of bone, longitudinal bone growth. When bones increase in diameter, they literally thicken, usually by depositing osteoid onto existing uh, bone tissue or an existing uh, structure, we refer to that as appositional bone growth. Now we've seen this happening in both intramembranous ossification as well as endochondral ossification. In, in the case of intramembranous ossification, you might recall that we had begun to form the ossification center near the center of our structure that's supposed to become a uh, flat bone. And we had begun to form our double layered periosteum, which in its osteogenic layer has these osteoblasts and osteoclasts. We hadn't, when we're at the point where we have just formed our uh, immature spongy bone tissue called the woven bone tissue, and we have just barely begun to form the periosteum, we're still lacking the layer of compact bone tissue that would sit right here in between the spongy bone tissue that we're forming and the periosteum. And remember that we then explained that these um, osteoblasts will start secreting onto, or the osteoblasts that are present in the developing periosteum, they're going to start secreting osteoid in this direction, basically onto the existing um, um, tissue that we're now slowly but surely replacing with uh, bone tissue. When this happens right here, 
in intramembranous ossification, we could essentially refer to this as appositional bone growth. We also saw this happening in endochondral ossification, where here in endochondral ossification, we started out with a cartilaginous structure that had perichondrium around it, which at the time, at the start, I should say, of ossification would become periosteum with osteoblasts and osteoclasts in it. And remember, before things could really start falling apart in that primary ossification center, we really needed to strengthen the outside of the cartilaginous structure and produce a bone color. And this is where our osteoblasts played a role in beginning to deposit osteoid onto the existing cartilaginous structure, which then ultimately led to the formation of a little bit of a bone color in our cartilaginous structure. So we're kind of strengthening the outside such that then, and there might still be, you know, the rest of it's still probably cartilage tissue, so that the inside could start falling apart. And you know what happens there, the cartilage cell starts to hypertrophy, eventually we end up with little cartilage remnants, and then the periosteal bud would ultimately move in, bringing in osteoblasts and osteoclasts uh, to start the process of ossification or the deposit of bone tissue. Also, uh, a form of appositional bone growth. So in both these instances, whether it is an intramembranous ossification or an endochondral ossification, we see that there's a deposit of bone tissue from a periphery onto an existing structure. Now, we will also see this happening in mature bone, bone that has finished growing and we will talk here in just a moment about the processes that occur in a uh, mature bone. And those two processes are collectively referred to as bone remodeling. But one of the processes of bone remodeling is appositional bone growth. So ignore for a moment that this is a cartilaginous structure and my labels and for a moment um, assume that this right here is the diaphysis of a mature bone with its periosteum around it. Well, if you needed to thicken your bones because you're beginning to work out, for instance, you would also start depositing bone tissue from the periosteum onto the existing diaphysis. Or perhaps you're not uh, or, or perhaps this is not a mature bone. Maybe this is a growing bone, which is really what the focus of this video is. We're looking at uh, what is happening in children. And again, in children, their diaphysis and maybe even to some extent, um, yeah, let's just leave it at the diaphysis, would be able to thicken by means of the process of appositional bone growth. Bear in mind that if we do add tissue onto the outside of a structure, so if we do add tissue, bone tissue from the outside, then we also must deal with the medullary cavity and make it wider to maintain the lightness of the bone. So the last thing we need to still discuss with regards to bone growth in children both longitudinal bone growth and appositional bone growth, but especially longitudinal bone growth, is how does this all regulate it? And in children, the primary regulation is by means of hormones. And in early childhood, the most important hormone is growth hormone. That is the most crucial hormone for the lengthening of that epiphyseal plate, which ultimately leads to the lengthening of the whole bone. This is a hormone that is produced and secreted by the anterior pituitary gland, um, which, is a which is a pea sized gland that dangles off the inferior portion, more or less, of your brain. You'll learn much more about this gland in 
AMP2. Growth hormone, along with the pituitary gland, also impacts the secretion of uh, another hormone produces, produced by your thyroid gland, namely thyroid hormone. Remember, your thyroid gland produces calcitonin. We've learned that before, and now you learn that it's also secreting thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone pretty much impacts all metabolic activities in all of your cells. And metabolic me metabolism, remember, uh, includes any chemical reaction in the body that builds more complex molecules to uh, any chemical reaction that breaks down molecules to make them more simple. And so ultimately, your growth hormone along with the thyroid hormone is going to impact the lengthening and the shape of the skeleton, um, more the lengthening or the growth of the skeleton, even muscles and many other tissues as well. Now, earlier I mentioned there comes a point in time when that epiphyseal plate will turn into just a mark, which we call the epiphyseal line. So that epiphyseal plate doesn't persist for the rest of our lives. And we know very well that when we hit puberty or adolescence, we go through a growth spurt. And this has to do with the fact that at that time, our reproductive hormones, testosterone and estrogens, start to rise in levels in our bodies. And that is also going to stimulate the division of those cartilage cells. As a matter of fact, they're going to speed up their division and the ossification process uh, that is happening in the zone closest to the medullary cavity is going to increase. But this sped up process doesn't persist. There comes an end to this. As a matter of fact, towards the end of puberty, what's going to happen is that the rate at which the division, the rate at which mitotic divisions um, occur in the proliferation uh, zone is going to become less and less than the rate at which ossification occurs. And so therefore, or I should say this, the pace, maybe the term pace should be better. So if we're slowing down how the, the, the speed or the pace with which we're producing more cartilage cells, but we're speeding up the pace at which we're ossifying um, nearby the medullary cavity, then clearly, eventually, we're going to end up with no cartilage cells anymore. And so that's when we talk about the closure of the epiphyseal plate or the closing of the growth plate, we say in layman's terms. At the same time, these two hormones, testosterone and estrogen, are also going to start shaping our skeleton more so to where we can, as a skeleton, be identified as either a female or a male. Prior to this, this process of masculinization and feminization of the skeleton, uh, a child's skeleton cannot easily, if at all, be identified as being either male or female. We really need to have the help of these two hormones, testosterone and estrogen, to shape our skeleton.